What's up, everybody? It's Chris Enriquez, and you're watching another episode of Age of Quarantine. Thanks for joining me on another episode. This whole thing has been really awesome, and uh, yeah, we've been getting really good reactions. Last Friday, we got rip, written up in Billboard, which is uh, totally fucking the last thing we expected so um thanks to all of you for watching every night at eight o'clock eastern standard time monday through friday here at the saint vitus bar channel and most of all thank you to everybody who donated uh the uh, amount of people that uh donated today has surpassed the goal of fifteen thousand dollars so uh give yourselves a round of applause as you're sitting home, watching on your couch, having dinner, or whatever you're doing. Thank you so much to everybody. Really, 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 really appreciate that. You guys are awesome. Uh, let's help St. Vitus get to their 10 year anniversary, uh, the 10 year anniversary. I need to learn how to speak. Um, what you hear in the background, what's up, Jack's Makers? Indecision, Most Precious Blood, Lead Singer, Tom Sheehan, legendary New York hardcore band, we're going to be speaking with him in just a few minutes, but um, yes, so over at St. Vitus, everybody is super thankful for your contributions. If you haven't donated and you want to donate, visit the St. Vitus socials, Instagram, easy, when we're done here, just watch. Um, when you're done watching, you can go on the uh, regular feed and you can, um, you'll see the latest post is a uh, video uh, with a link. Uh, to uh, click on so you could go donate at the um, GoFundMe, or I'm sorry, the Kickstarter. Also on uh, St. Vitus's uh, Facebook, you could go on there. But um, anyway, I'm going to welcome my guest, Tom Sheehan, from Indecision and Most Precious Blood and host of Axe to Grind podcast. We'll just be getting him on the screen in just one second here. This is going to be fun. I grew up in the uh, hardcore scene in the 90s watching this guy. Hey. Tom, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I'm hanging in there, man. I'm uh, staying entertained, trying to entertain people and just uh, keeping creative, you know? <laughs> love to hear it. Love to hear it. Absolutely. How are you uh, getting yourself through this uh, strange time? It's been managing? good. I mean, you know, still working, still kind of, you know, we're still, con my program that I work for is considered essential, so. We're still going. Cool, man. What do you What do you do for a living these days? So I run um, a nonprofit that assists um, people with mental illnesses coming out of Rikers Island, um, and kind of helping with the transition back to the community and stuff like that. That's awesome, man. I love that. All you guys, we'll we'll get into this too. Like, obviously, I want to talk about the history of. Uh, your history, your personal history, and the band, but uh, and, and also transitioning to what you guys are doing now, um, and it's just so cool that uh, you and Justin and 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 also the rest of your bandmates have all uh, continued to do sure. things for a living that are making a big uh, difference, uh, and and it just goes, it's a testament to what you guys stood for as a band, and you pra you you practice it in your uh, adult lives, in your, um, you know, in the professions that you chose, which is super cool. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, everyone watching, if you have a question, there's a little question mark box on the bottom, and uh, you can submit your questions there, and they'll appear on the screen um, when I uh, decide to take them. Uh, and again, we're here with Tom Sheehan, the lead singer of Indecision, formerly of Most Precious Blood, and the co-host of uh, Axe to, to Grind podcast. I can't speak today. Um, so let me start with this, Tom. Uh, obviously, we're in dark times, so I'm going to use this as a way to get back to more positive things. Um, where are you from originally? Uh, from Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Okay, born, born and raised, which is so rare these days. And, How um, weird is that? Isn't that weird? It is, man. I'm, I'm from Long Island, uh, but I grew up. Uh, you know, like 10 minutes out of Queens. So it was like the border. Right, and right. Uh, nobody is from here anymore. And, and and when you're 35 plus, it's a little weird. But um, for everyone else, it's it's quite normal. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. Uniform. So Sunset Park. Um, tell me how you uh, uh, first started getting into music. Um, in high school, a um, friend of mine uh, gave me a tape with Dinosaur Jr. on one side and Minor Threat on the other, and that was it. 
<laughs> and I was like, I don't know what these dudes are saying, but I'm into it. And then, um, yeah, and then I started going to shows. There was a venue in Sunset Park called the Crazy Country Club. Okay. That would have, like, hardcore shows and, like, going to see, like, early Marauder shows and, like, Confusion and Dark Side and stuff like that. And I went to high school with everybody, and, you know, with everybody in the band except for Rachel because we went to an all-boys Catholic high school. Um, yeah, and then that, from that, you know, from then on, I just started going to the city and going to Long Island for shows. And how, how, old, how old were you when you um, first started discovering hardcore and punk music? Probably like 15. It was like freshman year of high school. And did that come, well, you, you as you mentioned, you got a mixtape uh, with uh, Dinosaur Jr. and um, Minor Threat, I think yeah. you said. Was, so, you, so you started out with punk and hardcore. Before you didn't start out on metal, which is usually yeah. I mean, some he um, no. I mean, I think you know eighth grade, and so you know, in like freshman year high school, I liked like Anthrax and like Metallica, but I was never like that deep into stuff. Like it was mostly hardcore for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still love Anthrax. You know what I mean? So and the uh, the guys. And well, obviously, you mentioned Rachel didn't go to high school with you, but uh, right. you you went to. Did you go to grade school uh, or sorry, high school with all of your bandmates with Pat and Justin and uh, and Bago? Yes. Was that yeah. Okay. So it was Bago, Pat, and I are the same age, and Justin's I think three years younger than us. Interesting. Okay. Or four years? I think he was a freshman. We were a senior when we first met him. And so. Um, what were the like you mentioned one of the venues that you were going to, which I never heard of because I'm a, I'm slightly younger. But um, what were the uh, you know we're we're on the Saint Vitus Instagram and everyone had their version of that you know CB's Coney Island. You mentioned a place. What were uh, the first venues that you were going to to check out shows? Right, I mean I think it was like Crazy Country Club. There was another place in Bay Ridge called the Three Fifteen Club. Um, we would go to Lemoore's. You know, we went to CB's, we went to Bond Street, um, and then there were like odd, you know, often at like off and on places like like fucking Gasseteria or some, you know what I mean? That didn't have a ton of stuff, but we're like there very briefly. But I mean, like even with um, with Mike, I hate you. Um, even with uh, like someone like like the Crazy Country Club, it was so important to us, but it was probably open for like two years, three years maybe. Right. You know, but to us, it's like the fucking that was our CB's, you know, like and. Got to see, you know, like Starkweather there and like Life of Agony played there, and that was it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Is this the late 80s or early 90s? Early 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. Like, I, I obviously didn't grow up in Brooklyn. I was in Long Island. So, like, we had our different, like, we had Neglect and Mind Over Matter. You had right. Life of Agony and I'm guessing Biohazard. What were, if, if you, you, you mentioned a few bands, but like, what were, what were the regular bands that you were going to see that were local at the time? I mean, it was like Starkweather would come up all the time. Um, like it's like Dark Side MIC, Confusion. Um, who else? I'm, I'm blanking. There was a band called Nobody's Perfect. Um, I mean, Life Vagony was a local band, you know, at that point. Um, who else? Um... And then, like, we had, like, Without a Cause, we'd come down from the Bronx and play a bunch. We ended up becoming Fahrenheit 451. Um, oh, yeah, they were great. Yeah, and, you know, and, like, Neglect and all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, all those bands were bands that we would go see, you know, Cult of Life and yeah. Bond Street and stuff. Yeah. And uh, when was it that you realized that you wanted to be active beyond just being a fan? Um, like, when I first like, decided to, like, be in a band? Yeah, like, like, uh, like you. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, right. oh, this is cool. I actually want to do this now. Like, when did that happen for you? And, right. And how did that all take shape? Sure. I was probably like sixteen-ish, maybe beginning to be like almost early seventeen, and um, it was before I like kind of started the band with like Bagel and Pat and Justin and Rachel. Um, friends of mine from high school wanted to do a band, and we were. I remember walking down the hallway at the Felt Forum, which is now whatever the fuck it's called, WAMU, whatever they've called, they've changed the name 17,000 times. <laughs> there was a small venue at the gar at Madison Square Garden. And I went okay. to go we went to go see uh, Pantera and Skid Row. Wow. And, uh, like, we mostly had gone to Pantera. It was right after Vulgar, Vulgar Display. And they were talking about being in a band. I was like, I'd like to be in a band. 
And they're like, you want to do it? I was like, all right. And we covered domination and we were terrible. But, <laughs> um, I, that was it. Yeah. And then we started from there. That's funny because my first show was Skid Row uh, in Long Island. Uh, Dude, but they were Skid Row at like Slave to the Grind, fucking hard record. Yeah. It's you can't fantastic. Really, it really is. Yeah, I love uh, and my uh, Youth Gone Wild has a great like hardcore sing along. Oh, of type of heart, the backups you know and I mean? stuff. Yeah, that was uh, that was with uh, Guns N' Roses in 1989 for me. That's a uh, that's a good uh, with, gig. Yeah, man, that's just a funny coincidence. Um, now, um, what what year did Indecision officially start? And 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 tell us like. Like, like if you can, I know there's a movie out there, which I'll plug later, if people want to, um, you know, spend some time getting the deep dives. But like, what's the story behind the inception of Indecision? Sure. So like in early, late 92, we did another band called Former. I don't know why. If Bag goes on here, you can tell the story and I'll read it. But like, I don't know what <laughs> we were called Former. Pretty much the same people other than Rachel. Um, it was pretty bad. Um, and then Former broke up, just couldn't do it. You know, like the grind of the road. We played like three shows. It was too much. And um, they were starting another band, and uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't have me in the band because they didn't want you know it to, it to sound like former. So they tried like other people out, and then <laughs> then I broke my way through, and I I ended up joining. Um, our first show was October of nineteen ninety three. So wow. We were, yeah, we were all eighteen, and Justin was like fifteen. Right. Right. Um, right. Yeah, we played a high school called Fort Hamilton High School. Um, and then, yeah, it was all downhill after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I first saw Indecision, it was at the PWAC in Long yeah. Island. For, for anybody watching, that was kind of our CBs in the uh, 90s. That, that stood for People with AIDS Coalition, and it was a spot that um, they would rent out, and um, it was a pretty big place, and they had everybody from, like, Fugazi to Sick of It All to Glassjaw to VOD – um, this was like a legendary spot. Anyway, when I saw you guys for the first time, I thought it was like the heaviest thing because I was just kind of coming into it. And in Long Island, the bands I was exposed to wasn't, they weren't that, um, they weren't as aggressive. You know what I mean? It was like South Majority. Right. Um, again, Glassjaw, Mind Over Matters. So, but later on, I have a, this is leading to a question. Later on, I, I realized you guys are um, kind of more on the artsier side than your typical New York hardcore band, where I'm going with this is like, what were the uh, influences, you know, because you didn't sound like Sick of It All or Agnostic Front, but you also were hardcore, you know, but it was it was something right. else going on, too. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the usual, like, New York hardcore staples were always a big part of it, like, like Sick of It All and Breakdown and AF and Leeway and stuff like that. Um, just really loved a lot of, like, the SSG stuff, a lot of, like, Black Flag um, and, like, Minutemen and stuff like that. And I think as we, like, kind of uh, grew up a little bit and sort of, like, got into, like, you know, a lot of the West Coast bands, like, Unbroken, and um, and then, you know, we started listening to, like, Rorschach and, and, and bands like that, like, a lot of the ABC bands. And it was kind of, like, this weird kind of amalgam of all of that. So it's, like, as much, of, it's as much like Blood, Sweat, and No Tears as it is, like, fucking Protestant by Rorschach. It's, like, a little bit of both. Yeah. Like, it's both. I was going to... I was going to mention Rorschach and uh, Born Against, which is interesting. A anybody watching, um, and Tom, I don't know if you saw this, but there's a documentary called New Breed about yep. the... Uh, yeah, the, I saw that. I yeah. saw it at St. Vitus. Oh, there you go. Uh, you know, it's one of the only New York hardcore documentaries, probably the only one that I'm aware of, that covers the ABC No Rio scene, which was this sort of um, stranger hardcore that was going on. Again, Born Against, Rorschach. Uh, Die 116, and you guys definitely had a little bit of that going on um, in your sound, yeah. you know, which was cool. Um, what, when, when did you guys make your first recording? I think it was, a, I had a demo before Unorthodox. Yeah, so we, we had like a ton of demos. Our first, like, I, we recorded in like 1993, which is like, thankfully lost to the sand at the time because it's terrible. Um, <laughs> and then we wanted to be Life of Agony in 1994. And then we started t kind of figuring it out. So, like, a lot of the stuff on the first record are just um, demo recordings that we had that we kind of juiced up a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and then we, we would play, especially on Long Island, we would play so often that we would, like, we had, like, this, like, chunk of, you know, say, nine songs that we had recorded. 
So we'd make a new demo every time we play Long Island, but it was the same songs, different orders, <laughs> different songs. Like, so it would be like, all right, these four on this tape. Next week, it's got to be four different ones. And we'd kind of like mix up the order. So they always looked like new, but they weren't. They were I all the same. Those, you know, but yeah. that, was a common, that was a common thing back then where you'd get like a seven inch, like I got the, the, the VOD seven inch and the demo. And then some of the same songs ended up on the full length. That was like, kind of normal yeah, back was, then, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it seemed that way. Yeah, yeah. And then suddenly it ends up in Rick to Life's distro, you know. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I have many of those stories. Yeah, whether or not you wanted it to, you know. So it's so a little little trivia for um, people out there that uh, may not know this, and I always had fun with this. I'm actually friends with Ron Thal, uh, Bumblefoot. And, uh, oh, awesome. We, and I mentioned this to people, and they don't realize it, so – uh, Ron Thal, a.k.a. Bumblefoot, who's like this guitar wizard, an amazing guitar player, ended up replacing Slash in Guns N' Roses in yep. the uh, Chinese democracy era, actually produced all of the Indecision records, correct? Yeah, and the Most Precious Blood record that I'm on. Oh, I didn't know that. I had yeah, so no the, idea. The two Indecision records that I'm on and the one MPV record I'm on was all with Ron and like demos and everything. Like we recorded everything with that dude. Because <laughs> he was like a local, he he like worked out of a studio in a friend of ours like uh, basement in like Bensonhurst, and he was always super nice. I remember like when we walked in, I was like, "Oh shit, I remember this dude," because I had seen he was in a band called Love Soup. Okay, okay. that was kind of like Primacy, and he was like the Les Claypool. <laughs> and I remember he had like a Swiss cheese guitar. And the guitar that when you hit the tremolo bar, wings would pop out. Right. And then I was like, you can't forget this dude. And all of a sudden, he was the guy recording us. And, like, you know, he was super, he was like this, like, fucking virtuoso. And we were, like, you know, a bunch of dorks that didn't know what we were doing. And he was super nice and, like, always supportive and kind of, it was awesome. Right, right. Great dude. That's, uh, we, well, we got a comment here. Uh, the, the indecision, shy halud split rules. Uh, that's uh, Andrew from the Dillinger comp the, the Dillinger compound. He did record that as well, right? He did. Yep. Yeah. Um, how did he take to uh, a bunch of Brooklyn hardcore kids? Was he into it? He was great. He was so great. He played on some of the. There's like a death metal song at the end of Unorthodox on the CD. He plays like the lead. He like shreds on it. Wow. And he sings wow. a couple of things too. When you guys found out that he replaced Slash and Guns N' Roses, how, how did you? Uh, react to that that must have been so fucking cool yeah we were stoked for him because he's a fucking incredible musician and like an even better guy and like you know we were psyched that he was able to kind of take it to that now you know he got to play arenas around the world and he's he's that talented so he deserved it we were stoked yeah um, and it's good trivia i could say like the guy from guns and roses record all my records it's so funny dude <laughs> did, you, did, did, did you realize i mean we were talking about uh, a bunch of the songs that you demoed before they ended up on unorthodox so um you know and then there was a bunch of songs that were newer at the time that made it but uh were you aware at all i know this is like a weird question like um and that could come off like uh pompous if like depending on how you want to answer that but like did you know you were making something special uh when you when you put those songs together and made unorthodox um honestly not at all we talk about yeah. this all the time like so at the time like we, like we kind of through, it was like kind of like, all right, so uh, Exit's going to put this record out. Let's just get together what we have. And then they wrote um, a bunch of songs in Bago's, like Bago had a sub sub basement in Bay Ridge that they recorded. They wrote a few more songs. And then we went and like recorded whatever we had, kind of added some more tracks to the stuff we already recorded, and then just like put it out. We were so dumb. When it first came out, Ron was like, do you want to get this mastered? And we're like, we're fucking punk. We don't need mastering. Right, right. right. <laughs> so the first version of Unorthodox that like was on CD and record and everything was never mastered. It was only mastered like four years ago. That is hilarious because you're you're like oh you that's the punk rock way. You don't know what mastering is. Right, or... it's like it's all glossy and shit. We're dirt, like we're punk, man. Fuck that. Stupid. Yeah. But like Absolutely. if I had known, like if you know that, I'd be on a fucking talking on a phone about a record fucking 20 something years later, we probably should have spent a little bit more time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the, the writing though, I always wanted to know, did Justin, well, Justin wrote most of the music, right? Or was it a collaborative effort? 
I mean, I think you could say it was collaborative. He wrote a lot of, um, I mean, he wrote a lot of, like, the skeletons of stuff, and, like, we'd all kind of work through it together. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, he would never come in, like, here's the song, here's what you're playing, here's what you're playing, here's everything. And we're sort of, like, we would, most of the time, it was just us fucking around. And then it would be like, okay, <laughs> you know, and, like, just jamming jam black right yeah. 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 I mean, those are the days that I, I really miss as somebody that, like, kind of had a similar situation where you would just have the time like as an adult you don't have the time to just sit around for like eight hours with your friends in a garage you yeah, know they they mean? yeah of course imagine just being able to like sit around and just fucking play that riff 25 times until we get the beat that we want you know like who oh nothing yeah uh those are the days we're doing some shout outs here what's up we got bago in the house we got rob catalano we got a bunch of friends what's up oddly <laughs> um so yeah, the lyrics, yes, indecision did tour with I just saw it. The indecision tour with all. Yes, they did. Okay, there you go, Andrew. Guys, if you have any more questions, uh, just put them in the question box. It's easier that way. Um, did you uh, collaborate lyrically with uh, Justin, or was that? I always wanted to know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think um, a lot of it was like um, they like we'd we'd get the song together and I'd kind of go back through the lyrics and like we kind of. Uh, almost had like a just like a book of stuff and like we kind of go through and piecemeal stuff together or like you know um he had th these lines that i liked i would add one thing like it was sort of, i mean he did oh, i mean to be fully transparent a lot of it was him but uh it was a call i mean we all collaborated i mean i don't think it works otherwise you know? yeah. yeah and then obviously like you mentioned being catholic schoolboys that had to have played a role into um, um and i can relate to that too because i grew up in a mostly christian town i think that a lot of people have that sort of uh what when you get into hardcore and punk it's because you're rebelling against something sure you know? um and a lot of, yeah a lot of the album and, and, and all the way to um to most precious blood um the the album and um and and the band like had a lot of that in there right right Is that fair to say oh absolutely yeah i mean going you know it's sort of, you know, especially in high school, it's like you're in a cat all boys Catholic high school. It, you, there's two ways to go, and we went, we went the other way, you know. Who are uh, who are some of the vocalists that uh, that you drew inspiration from? Um, I love, uh, I mean, still Zach from Rage and Inside Out. Um, Rob Fish. Oh yeah. Um, I think everyone wanted to sound like Tim Vod. I was one of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> His voice was just ridiculous. Um, no one ever really did it, but he was like, he was like, when those demos and stuff came out, we're like, holy fuck. Um, I mean, I think, you know, George Reynolds, everybody wanted to be like George Reynolds, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we didn't have the talent of like George or like, or, you know, um, like Julian from Still Suit and stuff, but that's what we were looking at. Chaka from Burn, you know? Right, right. You're, you're naming a lot of... Um sort of like like more of the underground New York characters that we grew up around, you know, for anyone watching that's, uh, these are some like hidden gems uh, that we grew up around, like Mind Over Matter. It's actually the guitar player for Mind Over Matter owns St. Vitus. So yep. if you want to do a deep dive, um, check them out on Spotify. All their albums are streaming and uh, Still Suit is another great band. A lot of these bands are on Wreckage Records um, and Exit, which uh, a lot of the Indecision stuff came out on. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, Rob Fish from 108, who right. uh, was amazing. Um, that's cool, man. I and, and, and those were all my favorite bands. I see all you guys playing together. One of my favorite shows was at Coney Island High in the 90s. It was a Wreckage showcase, um, I remember. And yeah. they put out a compilation. You guys were on it. And, yeah, uh, Mindset Overhaul, yeah. That's right, that's right. Um, what, uh, when you made the uh, Most Precious Blood, the, the record, now I'm yeah. talking about the Indecision album, Most Precious Blood, sure. uh, can you, can you kind of tell me a little bit about that record and how that came together? Because you didn't have demos, that was like, you guys made a cohesive record. Right, uh, right, and that's, that was like the big difference. I think that was the first time we ever wrote like, we like, all right, we're gonna get together and we're gonna write an LP. Like, you know, we had some of those things, like, one, once Unorthodox came out, we had some of those songs, and, like, we played them live and stuff. But, uh, 
Are you getting like dirty questions or something? <laughs> I got, no, I got, I'm look. I have four questions that I'm going to pop up after you. No, all right. Uh, um, but yeah, it was our first time actually like getting together and like writing a record. And we would go out to this place called Josie's Nut Shop on, um, <laughs> it, was, it was in, I feel like it was an island park on Long Island. Okay. And we would literally go there. Like we shared a space with like Kelly Riddles, fuck, maybe Judas Iscariot and like one other band. And literally, it was like downstairs under a candy shop, and we would just <laughs> go there and like write and write and write and write, and then we had this LP, and that was it. That's amazing, dude. Yeah, I, I love that shit. Like, it's so different now. Like the way people do things. You you you, you rent a practice space. There's a million bands in there, but it's not like you know, like underneath a candy shop. I was just interviewing um, John Stanier from Helmet the other oh, awesome. one, the previous episodes. Yeah, they they shared a practice space with Sonic Youth in the Lower East Side underneath Welcome to the Johnsons in the 80s. Holy and, shit. Um, and Thurston Moore had guitars all over the walls in different tunings because they didn't know how to play guitar properly. So they were all like tuned for each song. And, they, and that was like 1988 or 1989 or some shit. No shit. That's amazing. Could you imagine? Okay, so we got some questions. I'm going to pop up on the screen. You're going to be able to see them. All right, let's see if we can make this one out. Tom, this is from Dolphin Farts. <laughs> Tom, what was the first punk or hardcore record you remember buying? Bonus, if you know where it's from. I think it was the first one I bought. I, I want to say it was Sick of It All, Blood, Sweat, No Tears. It was a white cassette. And I bought it at um, uh, the Record Factory on 86th Street in Bay Ridge. Wow, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to get you on some lists in a little, like at the end, I'm going to ask you some lists, uh, questions. Cause you know, sure. you know, people love that shit from doing your podcast. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Dola, Dola whip. I don't know what that means, but that's Dole whip. Um, it's Dole whip. Dole whip. Do you enjoy, do you enjoy any bands that use indecision as a direct point of reference for their sound? That's a great question. Do I enjoy them? Yeah. I think yeah. they're the best ones going. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, flattery is the best. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, no, I, I think it's awesome that if anybody remembers us and, like, you know, uses us as a point of reference, that's fucking cool. But I think yeah. I, they just happen to be some of the best bands going, so it works out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is funny. I'm reading the comments. Surprise Your Dead says, me and Ray, brick by brick, used to work at Record Factory. That's our buddy Mike. Uh, Andrew Castle from Perfect World and Total Meltdown says true or false heroes and conspiracies is an integrity riff question mark that is true we wrote that which <laughs> was like you can't sing it like and i was like oh shit that's exactly the same it's never forever i yeah it's a, it's an integrity song yeah amazing yeah um shout out to jeremy from uh super touch um okay so miracle uh, drug what up? hell yeah man so uh um, so, so you mentioned that uh, Most Precious Blood, the album, that was like the first time you like went in and like, we're going to do this. Um, yeah. I thought it was a fucking great record. Um, and, and you can answer this in any way that you want and stop me if there's any, any uncomfortable topics. But like, why? Like, why, I, I know the answer to this because I saw the movie. But like, what, how, how long did you stay in the band after that? And then ultimately, why did you leave? Because you, you did leave for a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, so... That record, actually, that show that you were talking about, the Mindset Overhaul show, was also the record release show for Most Precious Blood, the song. The record. Right. Um, so that was June of 98, and I was out of the band by September 98, thereabout, or August. So, I mean, we only did, like, one tour. It, it was sort of like the record kind of got lost to time just because... It was like, Dan Hardy was in the band. They re-recorded some of those songs. And I was like, well, I can either listen to the record with the new guy or listen to those same songs with the old guy. It was the new guy, you know? Right. Um, right. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think with the band itself, it was just sort of, um, I had gotten into like grad school, so I kind of wanted to go do that. And they wanted to still tour. And um, I was like, I mean, I'll be fucking fully transparent. I was goddamn miserable on tour because these tours were terrible. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, going out there like month, you know, every summer we'd be out for three months and, you know, us and Silent Majority would be playing to our, each other most of the time. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Meanwhile. Yeah, people, 
people don't realize that too now um it's funny because you know a, a total coincidence a couple hours ago a friend of mine sent me a flyer um it was a uh, indecision on the might of prince's kelly rival show in the middle of ohio um and right, this is right. unplanned and um um and there was nobody there there was like right. 10 10 or 15 people there you know what i mean so you know it's just kind of crazy and now you think um you know if these shows happen today they'd be at like Riffin plaza you know what i mean <laughs> which is oh, nuts yeah. i mean we played um a basement on a millhouse sound majority tour in ohio it was millhouse sound majority indecision botch dillinger and jesuit unbelievable, like, unbelievable. that would be ridiculous i mean you know uh, surprise your dad wants to know, well, he's got a comment and a question. Mike's most not precious, following the rules. <laughs> most Precious Blood still still have the most anticipated debut show at Lemoore's. Uh, are there any, are there any unreleased indecision songs that people have never seen or heard about? Um, we recorded, um, Merchandise by Fugazi. Um, okay, that's for, for, yeah, for the split with, with Shai Halud. But we weren't, we, uh, Discord wouldn't give us clearance to use it. So that's recorded somewhere. Dude, that's fucked up. You gotta get, dude, that's sick. I wanna hear that. I said, yeah. Um, we had, uh, there's another version of a song on the split. This is like my crowning achievement, um, or our, one of our crowning achievements. We had to, um, we used a Bob Dylan sample. Okay. At the end, like, uh, times were changing. And we had to get clearance from Bob Dylan to use it wow so we had to send him the lyrics and he was like i really like he let it he gave us clearance like Holy he enjoyed shit. it and he, yeah and we um we, i mean we'd have to pay for it and revelation or crisis was not going to pay for it but bob dylan <laughs> read our lyrics and he was into it so i was pretty psyched um i'm trying to think what else that's crazy man. there's a negative approach cover that i sang on that i don't think ever came out um that they re hey look Hi, Pat Flynn. It's Pat Flynn. The, uh, got the, the main one, not the not the guy that's in my band. He's in another band. Okay. That's pretty good. A couple bands. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like that, the Bob Dylan thing was cool. Ian McKay, Ian McKay would not give us clearance because Revelation was considered had major league major label distribution. You and know what? Like, if you if you ever want to put that out again, I know someone at Discord, so let me know. And I'll see what I can do. <laughs> but he was actually super nice. Like I had to, um, I had to uh, reach out to him for something about the uh, the indecision discard uh, documentary. And he was like super awesome. But like I get it, you know. My whole thing was so he wouldn't let us use it, but he let um, that show Entourage use Minor Threat. And I was like, how the fuck? This show's about That's a bunch crazy. of drug acts. I had no idea that uh, yeah. that ever happened, man. Um, what were your uh, feelings on uh, Artie joining the band? And, you know, what was that like? Was that tough? Were you pissed? Or, or were you like, I moved on? No, I mean, at the time, I was pissed. Super pissed. Right. But, okay. um, I mean, I get it. You know what I mean? It's cool. You know, and he did it for a little bit. And then came back home, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, it's I, fine. I mean, it's I guess, no well, I won't stay on this too long. But I guess the no, burning yeah. question is, like, were you... Were you um, did you, did you actually, I'm sure it was tough to listen to those records at the time, but like later on, did you ever go back and check them out? What did you think of those records they put out with him? Um, I think the, uh, so that Pat, the, um, uh, that first one, um, what the hell is it called? The Live and Die in New York City. Oh, I thought it was good. <laughs> Release the topic. Release the topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought that record was cool. I thought Release the Girl was cool. had a lot of good songs, but I think it was a little too long. Like, I, don't, I wouldn't have wanted to sing on that record. That's how I usually gauge anything. I would be like, I wish I was in this band. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. I, I like, like fucking, I'm going to fucking lick oddly. Like, I listen to Incendiary. I go, God damn it, I wish I was in this fucking band. Like, yeah, when yeah. I listened to Release the Cure, I was like, eh, I'm not, I'm not that upset that I'm not in this band. <laughs> Well, there's a tie-in question here from Lou the Genius. What up, Lou? Um, are there any indecision, most precious blood songs you didn't sing on that you wish you did? Um, yeah, I liked Dead by Indecision. I liked um, End of a Short Rope by Indecision. It was great. Um, uh, what else? 
uh, uh, what the fuck's that song called? Uh, Tunnel Vision. I really like that. Um, there are no most precious blood songs that I wish I was on. <laughs> no <laughs> Woo! God damn. Sorry. Yeah, I'm good. Um, you uh, you returned to the band after they after Indecision broke up. They reformed under the name Most Precious Blood. Right. You rejoined. What was that like? What made you come back? And then like, why did you leave a second time? Um, if you asking. Yeah, that's no, fine. Yeah, so I think like Justin had hit me up about. Like, he's like, we should, you know, like, fuck around and just, like, do a band. Like, nothing serious. Like, we will not we will barely, um, you know, play weekends. Like, it'll just be, like, super chill. I'm like, okay. I'm like, we're going to have to have a long conversation. So we had, like, a kind of airing of the grievances. And then we just started, like, practicing and stuff. And it was, like, Justin on guitar, um, Rachel on bass, and this dude Pete playing drums. Um, and that was, like, the lineup on the demo. And then um, Pete left. And then... Um, and then Pat from a decision joined. So I mean, literally the first release, uh, nothing in vain is is indecision. Like, fully. right? It's kind of funny how how it ended up just being, and it sounds like the next indecision record. I, yeah. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but it sounded like indecision, but maybe the guitars were tuned down a little lower or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. It was like a heavier version of indecision, and then, um. Yeah, and then, like, Pat joined for a little bit, and then he quit, and then they've had, like, 14 drummers since. But what, Matt what, Miller joined MPB, and that was my favorite part of being MPB. Well, uh, yeah, I, I remember that record is fucking amazing. It still is. It All the stuff, and I'm not just saying this to you. Obviously, I choose the guests because they're guests in bands that I like. But, um, but like, those records hold up, and that fucking Most Precious Blood, the, the Nothing in Vain, really holds up today it sounds like it was recorded yesterday you know Thank um you. yeah yeah well, um i and i saw you guys i just have to share this i saw one of your first shows uh at cbgb's and i'll never forget it i was standing off to the side i don't know if that's online i gotta find it but it was a it was a great show and i think you played indecision songs um in yeah you didn't have enough songs in the beginning right right it's kind of funny um okay so what uh, what was the reason for you leaving um, that I'm not so sure because I felt like the, the MPB stuff was, it was a lot more fun just okay. because like from the get go, we had, um, like tours were good. Like we got to do like a bunch of stuff and like got to over sick of it all. We got to over like Andrew WK and like, we got to do like a lot of cool shit, you know, um, just but, like based off of like pretty much off the work that Indecision had done already and like the groundwork. Um. And then I don't remember exactly why. Like, we were fighting a little bit, I guess. I don't even remember. There was a lot of internal stuff that I probably shouldn't talk about. Not with me. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. That I was kind of, like, involved in somehow. Um, that kind of worked out against me. <laughs> yeah, Mike Frail is right. The, that show that you're probably talking about, like, we played with, um, they were called Age of Quarrel. But right. it, it was Chrome Eggs. It was Chrome Eggs, Scarhead, Damage, and his band... Um, Fuck. I'm blanking on the goddamn I can't remember either, man. It's yeah. so hard to remember. Um, I got mine like a steel trap. I remember everything. Well, you know, at that point, um, you know, Indecision, before they broke up, they were doing, like, they were really going for it, touring with Hot Water Music and Misfits and yeah. all sorts of bands. And, uh, like, it felt like Most Precious Blood. Uh, obviously, you were not on the later records. Like, it felt like from the from the beginning of it, I mean, you and I know a lot of bands in that era. That was when bands started getting like famous and big in our scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, something we'd never experienced before. And you had Hellfest and all this crazy shit going on. It was the mindset for Most Precious Blood to become more of like, all right, let's go for it. We're going to be a professional band and really fucking try to um, try to take it somewhere, so to speak. No, I mean, in the beginning, it was like super like, we're just going to like maybe play some weekends. So like, we did like our first week. We played our first two shows were one Friday at Lemoore's and then that Sunday at CV's. The show after that was in Atlanta. We drove to Atlanta because Atlanta, like Indecision, always did really well and it was awesome. But it was like totally worth the trip. Um, and then like we got signed to Trustkill, and then it sort of was like, well, we could do like this, like you know, week to Florida with Sick of It All. Oh, all right. And then <laughs> then it was like then I was out of my house constantly. I don't think we had any like 
being a hardcore band, it, like, I mean, we should, probably should have known better, but at the time, there was no, like, delusion that we were going to be, like, you know, take over. You know sure. what I'm saying? Like, we, we didn't wear makeup. We didn't dress nice. We were a fucking punk band that happened to be on a big label, you know? It's so crazy when I think about a band like Hatebreed, too, because, like, when I first saw Indecision, it was around the same time I saw Hatebreed with yeah. bands like One for One and um, obviously, you know, that whole scene. And, like, they they never had to wear makeup or do any of that silly shit. They didn't even have a guy shredding, and they still managed to get as far as they did. So, like, it's just right. wild sometimes when you think about that. But that's also, like, one in a uh you know in a million yeah, like yeah, yeah. Hardcore if you write a record that. like satisfaction you write a record like satisfaction you could do right. whatever the fuck you want to do you know what i mean like you <laughs> fuck know. yeah man. and it took them a while um, too you know it took them a long time to really hit yeah for sure i'm gonna get a uh, i'm gonna take some more questions yes uh, all right let's do this one from uh a, a drink to remember my boy cory bonfiglio from beer street uh When's that? Oh, hold on. When's that farmer demo coming out on vinyl? Um, oh, it, on. It'll be a giveaway at my funeral. He had a more serious question. Let me find it. Here it is. Whose idea was it to cover The Cure? It was all of us. I think that was the band we all agreed on. Awesome. And um, we have another one. Okay. Beatdown Barbie wants to know, what's your favorite song on Unorthodox? Hey, what's up, Beatdown Barbie? Um, fuck. <laughs> it's tough. I know. It's, uh, it depends, though, because, like, on the record is one thing. Like, live, probably Hollowed or, like, like or Purgatory or something. But, like, right. those songs recorded are not as good as they are live. I like, um, I always say, like, I said Safe Haven the last time, which is, like, a song we've probably played, like, five times. But it's, like, our kind of, yeah, it's our ode to, like, quicksand, I guess. Let's see. This is a long question. Exchange Change wants to know, I remember Coney Allen High. Were you influenced by the band Beyond at all? Kevin mentioned you. Uh, were you guys influenced by Beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think, anything, quite honestly, uh, we loved Beyond. Um, me and Justin loved, like, 1.6 band and stuff like Great. that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think anything with Vic was a bit, you know, a big part of, of what we did. And I loved kind of, um, I remember getting like that Beyond Discography that was on Temperance, I think. No, no, it was on some. Some records. On some records. And it was, yeah, they were always super important too. Because I feel like they were kind of off the beaten path too and sort of weird. I thought they were great. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's actually a, a documentary. And, and whoever asked that question, I actually played in Beyond last year. <laughs> Just had to throw Amazing. it in there. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, uh, they're making a documentary right now, uh, about beyond. And if you are a fan, um, you can watch the trailer. It's got members of Gorilla Biscuits and Civ and Shelter and 108 and Youth of Today and Burn. It's got a lot of, um, people in that, uh, documentary. Okay. So, um, and Tom John Capone, Lee. I don't know how I forgot to mention Dom, Tom Capone. Oh, Tom Capone, man. Amazing what guitar player. Like. Uh, John Mee wants to know, what is your favorite Long Island band? Um, of all time, probably... Um, I'm going to say a tie between... Fuck. There's a lot of good bands on Long Island. Yeah, man. That's a God, tough one. Damn, that's tough. I'm probably going to go a tie between um, Old Friend and Newer Friend, Silent Majority, and Innocent, uh, Incendiary. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. And you know what? This is your interview, but I'm just going to chime in and just say I agree with you because if you're going to go with the old, Silent Majority would definitely be number one. And I definitely think um, Incendiary is my personal favorite that kind of took that era and kind of brought it into a contemporary space. But you think about even all the bands that were around with both of those bands, like fucking anybody, you know, Inside and On the Mighty Princes and Taking Back right. Sunday and you know, bands that can't be named anymore, and Glassjaw, and, you know, like, right. so much right. fucking great. Millhouse was fucking incredible. Like, there's so much stuff, like... You know who was fucking great that I was just talking about the other day was Motive, and... Um, Amazing. And, and, and it's because I was listening to Unearthly Trance, and those are the guys... Uh, it's the guitar player, Ryan Lipinski from Motive, and right. um, they were just such a good band. 
Um, Ryan a does a band with Bago and Pat from Indecision. Oh, shit. I got to hear about that, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, speaking of Long Island, what's up, Melinda Lynn? How you doing? She's got a question. What is Tom drinking? Um, water with a little bit, like, with this. I'm straight edge, so, but it's only iced tea, like, it's an iced tea spritzer. Just trying to make sure the uh, the edge hasn't gone dull. Over the there, edge is know? still strong with me. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, let's see. Uh, what I, this is a question I have. What are your what are your top? Uh, what's your favorite record of your catalog? Um, nothing in vain. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, when and how did you guys decide to reunite? And, um, yeah. All right, so the whole story was we were supposed to – we got asked to reunite for um, those silent majority shows at the downtown. Okay. Um, the benefit for James, right? Right, right. R.I.P. James is the best. Amazing dude. I have a good – yeah. So we couldn't do it because – Rachel, I'm going to talk shit just about you. We couldn't do it because Justin had tickets to go see The Faint and Bright Eyes. <laughs> that's fucking great yeah and i was like are you fucking kidding me so then we um so we weren't able to do that we got asked to do uh black and blue bowl soon thereafter we were able to make it happen not everybody was willing to do it at the time so like we kind of did it as a um a like kind of it was it was um justin me and rachel mike from candiria on bass and paul um klein from Suburban Scum and the Banner and, and a ton of bands um, on drums. So we did that once to kind of raise money for James. Right. Um, so, like, we donated, like, all our merch money and all the money that we got from the show to James. Um, he actually got – he played with us. Um, he played a song with us. Yeah. Did I ever tell you a story? So, like, he – so we had this idea, like, oh, he'll jump up and play one song with us. So he was living in Lindenhurst with his fiance. Right. He used to practice in Staten Island. So we're like, hey, can you come out and just, like, jam with us once? You talking about James? James McCall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he drives from fucking Lindenhurst to Staten Island, over the, like, just over the Verrazano, because he's going to play uh, shadow boxing with us. And okay. he comes all that way. Dude sets up, fucking nails it. One shot did not need to come all the way to fucking Staten Island. To <laughs> and he, like, literally was just, like, literally the most practice we had was how to hand the bass off in between songs. Like that dude was, was had it was very perfect. talented, incredibly talented. Yeah, but like he nailed it the first time. It's like, oh, this poor bastard made him come all the way out here for nothing. Um, and then he, yeah, he, we played with it with him, and then um, that was kind of be, gonna be it. And then we did another show out on Long Island in Levittown with Mind Over Matter and Capital and and a bunch of bands. Um, yeah, awesome. you you do a lot every year. Yeah, um, but that was another benefit. That was after he had passed. We did, like, another – his family wanted to do, like, a benefit for, like, Ronald McDonald's house because they were, like, super good to them when James was sick. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we did that, and then it was like, well, that was fun. And then it was like, well, Motive played as well. Um, fuck, I can't remember everybody else. Um, but, yeah, that show went really, really well. And then it was, like, kind of became a thing that we play, you know, like, once a year, mostly, like, kind of – um, benefits, just show benefits and stuff to kind of you know just to to say that we were able to do it. Like we got to play Urban Plaza, which is fucking cool, you know. Hall, then, yeah. And then we were it mostly for us. It's just about getting to play with like bands that we loved. You know, we got to play with Rorschach, yeah. and we got to play with Unbroken, Tension played. I'm gonna. Yeah. I feel bad because I'm gonna breeze through this, but I, and I don't know if you know this already, but it kicks you off after one hour. So oh shit! Yeah, well, I and, talk a lot. God damn it! All right. No, no. This is Sorry. the whole point, and and Sorry. it's great. This is what happens when you're having fun. I I can't believe that we've been talking for 50 minutes already. Um. So we're down to the last 10. Um. Uh, will you, Will you ever put out new music with Indecision? Um. We have a song or two written. We just have to um get everyone together to to finish writing. We've been talking about it forever. Um. I would like to. Yes, Rachel, Tom can talk. I'm, I'm partially professional now. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, you know, we'd like to do something. Cool. I, I hope so, man. That would be fucking dope. I feel like, um, 
you know, there's something to be said. Some bands, you kind of wish they just kind of leave it um, uh, to hang and dry and you want to see the old songs. But it would be cool to see you guys and Gal come back. Yeah, we're uh, just worried about it, it sucking and then people go, wow, they really should have just let that de be dead, you know? Which is a good lead in because you talk about that quite a bit on Axe to Grind. Um, tell me in a nutshell uh, what Axe to Grind is and promote it real quick and, and let's do some uh, social drops and all that. Sure. Axe to Grind is the best hardcore podcast in the world. Uh, <laughs> it's me and a, um, it will not be at the matinee. Uh, me, uh, a, a guy named Bob that worked at uh, Revelation that started Sound of Fury on California, and this dude named Patrick um, that's in End of the Year and um, Drug Church. And we just, you know, we kind of started it just to do like a, you know, we didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> you know, it was like, hey, you want to do this podcast? Like, all right, we'll give it a shot, see what happens. And then um, it's been going for a little over two years. And then it's been great, you know, and we've gotten to meet a lot of people, got to, you know, get into like a lot of new bands and stuff like that. Ian Dixon, would you stop it? <laughs> yes. Can we do a live session at St. Vitus? If, if Dave will book it, we will come. Sick. That'd would be people awesome. Go to a, would people go to a live, like, podcast well, thing? Uh, you know, they, they do um, go to watch Two Minutes to Late Night, which is the uh, St. Vitus talk show with, with like, have you yeah, seen that? Yeah, Brodsky. We're not Steve Brodsky. Yeah, no, but you know what? You, you got to put it this way. I think this is a cool... I think that there's a new interest for things of this nature. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you this much, you know, obviously we're talking about underground culture, but like if fucking Eddie Trunk can get a TV show, that metal show on VH1, if you ever saw that. Yeah. And like, I don't, I don't really care if I get in trouble for it. Like th there were cool elements to that, but overall kind of lame. Um, you know, I think that certainly people would want to go watch live podcasting. I mean, shit, I went and saw, um roger murray at a uh, fucking generation i went and saw you know john joseph do spoken word you know people people this is what happens when you get older and you're in a hardcore scene you know what i mean you got to become that guy that's right <laughs> we, we would do it it'd be fun yeah absolutely okay um axe to grind great podcast uh, tom i love tom even though he thought i was in the strider on one of his last episodes yeah i'm sorry about um, that i was it's cool um, I'm just fucking with you, um, <laughs> but it is a great podcast and, um, everyone should check it out. Okay. Top five New York hardcore albums go. Oh shit. Um, all right. So number one is, uh, bright side killing time. Nice. Uh, victim in pain. Um, fuck. So these are mine, right? We're not talking. These are cats. yours. These are yours. Right. Agnostic front victim in pain, killing uh, time, bright side. Crow Mags, Age of Quarrel. Of course. Um, uh, fuck. I'm going to say as a, as a, as a Brooklynite and as, um, so I don't go full, you know, I don't want to go full chalk. I want to go outside the box. <laughs> I'm going um, Marauder Master Killer. Nice. And, um, I mean, you got to go girl business to start today. Okay, cool. Blood, Sweat, um, No Tears would be up there, too. It's really fucking hard. No, that's hard. Like blood, sweat, blood, sweat, and tears is like the victim in pain for our sort of like forty age to yeah. forty-five age range. Um, so, okay, um, we're not done. We're not done with the list. Um, yeah, we got seven actually, minutes. I, I'm gonna improvise. We have we have seven minutes. I got two more lists for you. T uh, top five Long Island hardcore albums: um, Life of a Spectator, Cost of Living. Um, um, that's Solid Majority and... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably should do that. Um, yeah, so I would say Solid Majority, Life of the Spectator, and Sandary Cost of Living. Um, uh, are we count, does Glass Shot count? Yeah, of course. They're from Long Island. But they are they a hardcore band? They came out of the hardcore scene. Yeah. Uh, so I would say um, everything you want to know about Silence, I would probably go... Um, uh, that movie life record, the the one on Revelation. Okay. Um, fuck. You got one more, dude. I got one more. God damn it. Um, while, while you're thinking about that, I'm gonna tell a story that 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 involves you 
and music that uh, people may not realize the members of Indecision are into. Because you mentioned Justin went and saw The Faint and uh, Bright Eyes. Um, I saw you at an Elliot Smith show when he was still alive. Yeah, well, Plaza. good it was when he was still alive. That would be weird if he was dead. Well, obviously, but uh, but but I always thought that was cool. And you covered the cure that like that you guys had a broad taste and you were this heavy band. But um, uh, how cool is it that we got to see Elliot Smith? Amazing! I was so um, lucky. What show yeah. was that? Was that at the North Six? Is that Irving Plaza? Oh, I remember that show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I didn't know you, but I recognized you, and I was like, oh, that's the guy from Indecision, that Elliot Smith. And I thought that was so funny. That's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. Okay, so you got one more Long Island band. Fuck. Uh, da, 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 yeah, five minutes and another list to answer. Um, um, uh, why am I blanking? There's so many. There are so many. You got Neglect, Mind Over Matter. You got Motive, um, Crumb Suckers. I'm going to go um, Millhouse of Sending in the Milk. Great fucking record. Okay. I'm going to ask you to breeze through this in, in, in a few minutes. So I'll do better at this. You're, you're stuck in the quarantine. You have five records. What are they and why? Okay. Um, uh, uh, Julia Baker. Yeah, hell yeah. First Julia Baker record. Um, just got it. She's just, she's amazing. Um, I would, literally probably most of the records would be her records. Um, that Boy Genius record. Is fucking fantastic with her, Lucy Dacus and Phoebe Bridgers. Um, um, it can't be anything too heavy because I'm stuck here. You know? I, I, I stayed in a hotel with Spotlights, my band, in the middle of the country. And we woke up to a note from Julian Baker and had no idea who she was. And she noticed that we had the same van that she used. And it was a green van. And she was like, I'm guessing you're in a band. Good luck on tour. Love, Julian Baker. No shit, that's so fucking yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, three minutes was, on the clock. Three minutes on the clock. Uh, get up, kid, something to write home about. Um, <laughs> um, three more. No, I did. Th I did three already. Julian, ba you did two. Two Julian Bakers. Julian Baker, Boy Genius, which is her band with oh, Julian, okay. with other people. Okay. Uh, something to write home about. Um, Alkaline Trio. Um, from here to Infirmary. Okay. And uh, um, Nas Illmatic. Oh, hell yeah. God, I got to see Nas that back when that was out, too. That was a good, uh, that was a fucking classic, dude. That's Simon okay. Webster Hall. Okay. Uh, where can people follow you and your podcast? And then I'll, I'll go after you. Sure. Um, Axe to Grind podcast uh, at, uh, on Instagram. And I think it's Axe to Grindcast on Twitter. Um, no, how, Julian, they'll never make it. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good story, so I wish I could tell it. So, um, uh, and then I think I'm at Thomas Shan, like full name. Oh, it's on here, so you can follow me here. Yeah, and, and Indecision NYHC. Right, at Indecision NYHC, which is new. We're trying to get more stuff on there. Cool, cool. The last two minutes, uh, I'm going to say Pete? thank you. Thank you, Tom, for doing this. Thanks really for having me. And um, stay with me. You don't have to leave or anything, but I'm just going to let everyone know um, that uh, tomorrow we have Jason Black from Hot Water Music. Let me pull up the schedule. Um, we got a really exciting week ahead. Um, Jason Black of Hot Water Music tomorrow. Mike Bruno from Iron Sheik on Thursday awesome. the 9th. Sarah Taylor from Youth Code on uh, Friday. John Joseph of Cro-Mags on Monday. Um, and uh, we got a lot of other episodes coming up. We have members of Deftones that are going to come on and, and Quicksand. Awesome. So much cool shit. So um, it's the age of quarantine. If you just tuned in or if you missed it, it'll be on my personal YouTube channel, Christopher Enriquez, tomorrow. And you can watch this entire thing awesome. and stare at my face and Tom's face. Tom, Sorry. My condolences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Doing? All right. Stay safe out there, brother. You too. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to get knocked off here, but it's the age of quarantine. And you can donate to St. Vitus. Go to their socials. Find the Kickstarter and help them make it to 10 years. It's about to be nine years, and they can't celebrate. Help us make it to 10 years. Stay safe. 
clean your fucking hands and don't be a dick. Goodbye. <laughs>